Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Abominable Snowman Sighted Near Darrington by Two Youth Two Darrington area boys didn't believe in Abominable Snowman Sunday of last week. During the next 24 hours, they became firm believers. After returning from a week-long camping trip, they reported that three of the mysterious creatures chased them from Cub Lake high above the Seattle River to within a few hundred yards of their camp about a mile away. Mark Meese, 16, and Marshall Cabe, 14, were among eight teenagers who hiked from Downey Creek campgrounds up to Downey Creek and Bachelor Creek Trail Monday of last week. At 6.30 p.m., the boys made camp less than a mile from Cub Lake. After dinner, Mark and Marshall volunteered to hike to Cub Lake and Iswat Lake to scout for fish. It was on their return that they spotted the first of the creatures across Cub Lake. I asked Mark what it was, Marshall said. Mark at first thought it was a big bear or just a snag. But then the creature made a come on gesture with its arms and two more like him came into sight. As the boys watched, three creatures darted around the lake toward them. The boys said the three animals stood on their hind legs and ran like men. They looked more like big, well-built men than apes, Mark said. He said their arms came about to their knees. They were covered with long black hair, except on their faces. Their heads dipped in and out at the forehead, Mark said. Both boys said the creatures were 10 to 11 feet tall and moved with great ease. With the creatures coming after them, the two boys ran up a rock slide that sloped away from the lake. Halfway up, they looked back to see that the three creatures, about 50 yards behind, had spread out as if to surround them, they said. We were both so scared we were shaking, Marshall said. We told each other goodbye. We thought we were going to die. The three animals called to one another with high, shrill sound, according to the boys. At the top of the ridge above the lake, the boys dropped down to the camping area where their six friends were. At first, they didn't believe us, Mark said. But then, they saw how white and panicky we were, and they did. Both boys feel it was their sight or smell of the campfire that kept the creatures from pursuing them down the ridge. Have you ever believed the story of the abominable snowman? Marshall was asked. I never have believed in it. I always thought it was a bear. Now, I don't care what anybody says. I know it wasn't a bear. I know what I saw, Mark said. I've never seen anything like it before. Most of the group returned to Darrington Thursday after fishing in Downey Creek. None of them ventured into Iswat Lake as they had originally planned. District Ranger in Darrington District of Mount Baker National Forest said this morning that his office had received reports of the incident but was not taking it too seriously. He said he would not send anyone into this area, especially to investigate the report, but if we have anyone going up that way, we'll ask them to look around. He said the district has never had a report of any such strange creature. On to the next one. In Craze Harbor County in Washington, at 2.35 a.m., Deputy Sheriff Verlin Harrington was driving home along DK Road near Copalis Bench when he saw an eight-foot-tall hairy humanoid that was standing in the middle of the road in front of the car. Verlin hit the brake hard to avoid hitting it and got out of the car with a spotlight. Verlin aimed his spotlight at it, cocked his pistol, and was ready to shoot. The man-beast had a human-like face and was covered with dark brown hair 
except for the feet and the hands and ran away. The hair on the head was longer than the rest of the body and five to seven inches long. The creature also had breasts. The face was black and the fingers, face, and buttock were like a human's. The creature appeared to weigh 300 pounds. The next day, footprints 18 inches long by 7 inches wide were found. It was a female hairy humanoid. On to the next one. Sasquatch Watch When a Grays Harbor Deputy Sheriff driving up a deserted back road in the middle of the night spotted an 8-foot tall Hairy, muscular something in his headlights, he set off the great ocean shores Sasquatch Watch. The legendary Sasquatch, which is a West Coast cousin of the abominable snowman, is deep in Native American and woods lore, all the way up from Northern California up beyond British Columbia. It was 2.30 a.m. Sunday, July 27th, when Deputy Farland Harrington, an officer noted for his serious approach to his job was driving up DK Road, about 10 miles northwest of Ocean Shores. His lights picked out a hairy female, seven and one half to eight feet tall, with a head, torso, fingered hands, and 18 inch long feet covered with hair. Was it a bear? Harrington doesn't think so. Black bears don't get that tall. Besides, said Harrington. I never saw a sow bear with breasts that high up on her chest. Harrington reported his Sasquatch sighting to Sheriff Pat Gallagher and probably regretted it later after the county became a crawl with Newsman. Gallagher himself leaned toward the bear theory, but that didn't cool the story down much. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer sent down a two-man crew and described the story as more fantastic than an Ocean Shores press release. Ocean Shores young people had been talking about Sasquatch about three weeks prior to Harrington's sighting. Teenager Ruth Foss at an evening party near Duck Lake looked out the window and saw something big and hairy under a streetlight. Other guests at the party affirmed they saw something loping off into the darkness. They searched for tracks, but none were found. It has been a very dry July and August. It was recalled that last summer, in roughly the same area, two teenage boys camping out heard something large prowling around the tent, and in the morning found a well-defined track, though with no toe mark, in wet sand at the edge of the lake. Then, a week after Deputy Harrington had his encounter, two women driving at night on a side road out of Malone, east of Elma, past a Sasquatch standing beside the road, went on to an intersection and turned around. When they came back to the scene, the animal was still there, but moved off into the darkness. Last Thursday, a five-man work crew near the headworks of the Taloa water system in the Quinellat Reservation was subjected to a barrage of large rocks a fairly common Sasquatch activity, according to backcountry lore. Sasquatch have been blamed for crushing ridge poles of isolated cabins with watermelon-sized boulders and tumbling rocks down on pickups in isolated roads. The Taloa work crew said those rocks came uphill and one of them was weighed later at more than 400 pounds. The crew declined to work until a gun-carrying guard was brought in. Even then, said the foreman, there was a lot of standing around looking at the wood. The crew moved its activities closer to town. If we can prove the existence of these creatures, it will be one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the age. All the books will have to be rewritten. On to the next one. Robert Parker and some friends were fishing near North Bend in King County, Washington, when they heard a scream and saw a brown Bigfoot walk across the hillside. In Pierce County in Washington, on Puget Sound, Dick Hancock and Gary Johnson 
saw a Bigfoot run across the road and hit a metal road sign, leaving it bent. In Whatcom County, in Washington, a woman witnessed opening her curtains at 4 a.m. and saw a sad-looking, huge face covered with white hair looking in. In Stevens County, in Washington, a hairy humanoid was seen in the garbage dump by a butcher named Joseph Rhodes. The man-beast left 17 and a half inch long by 7 inch wide footprints with a very human appearance. The left foot appeared normal, but the right one was a club foot. At the front, the foot was twisted inward and kidney-shaped and indicated dislocation of bones along the outer rim. The third toe was also squeezed out of normal alignment. In Yakima County, in Washington, a deer hunter by the name of Roth Hendrich saw a pair of dark brown Bigfoot, seven to nine feet tall. The two creatures were reaching down to pick up something from under rocks as they walked uphill. In Thurston County, in Washington, an army sergeant by the name of Lloyd Stringer was driving on a foggy night when he hit a six-foot-tall Bigfoot that was standing in the middle of the road. Lloyd reported the incident to the local sheriff. The Bigfoot did not stay around to see what happened or exchange driver's licenses. On to the next one. In Lewis County in Washington. It was west of the Chinook Path. My name is S.H. At the time of the sighting, I was attending Washington State University and had to return home from college for some things I needed to take care of. I left Pullman late in the afternoon and did not get to the White Path area until sometime after 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. It was dark and in the fall. I guess it was around the first part of November. The year was 1969, and I was a sophomore in college. I was coming down the west side of the path and was just past the Chinook Pass cutoff and was headed around the big sweeping corner that was near the bottom of the hill. When my headlight picked up on the right side of the car, something moving and coming up the side of the road. Since this was a bank, I first saw the head and then as it moved up the bank, more of its body became visible. It did not look at me or the headlight of the car. I slowed down as I was not sure what it was going to do, and moved into the left-hand lane. I remember thinking, what is that? Is that a bear? No, but I had no explanation of what I was seeing. As I slowed down, the animal, which was standing on two legs, stepped over the guardrail and turned to start walking up the hill. The animal acted as if I was not even there. It did not seem startled or scared or frightened was like I was not even there. The size of it must have been eight feet tall or taller, as the guardrail was a little difficult for the animal to step over. It never looked directly at me, but seemed to be moving with a purpose. The animal was completely covered with hair, with long arms. It did not have the typical bare head and pointed nose, nor did it look like an ape either. Its movement was very graceful and smooth, and, as I mentioned, walked upright. The hair on the animal in the headlight seemed black, but with brown highlights. The whole sighting probably lasted no more than 15 seconds. As I passed by it in the left lane, it had turned to walk up the hill. As I drove down the road, I tried to rationalize what it was I saw. It was not a bear or an ape like we see in the zoo. I've often thought, I was seeing things having driven so far without stopping, but I still am clear I saw something that I've never seen before. I did not turn around and go back, although I thought about it, but felt that it would have been long gone. I'm writing this after having seen this animal so many years ago and having kept it to myself. It was 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. It was a clear night, no rain as I recall, and no snow yet in the mountains. As I was headed west on the left side of the car was a steep rock wall 
On the right, where the animal came from, it was forest and brush. It came walking straight up the side of the road bank. I don't remember it using its hand. On to the next one. I am employed as a teacher at a high school in Northern California, and I've spent some time exploring the mountains on the California-Oregon border the last two summers. Coming up from the Bay Area, the real wilderness areas have truly been an adventure. A fellow faculty member and I decided to try our hand at gold panning in the mountains above Happy Camp, California. We took my friend's truck and camper, and on the advice from local area authorities, we headed north out of Happy Camp. We met a miner, whom we were referred to by a state employee, and he sold us the gold pans, shovels, trowels, and right down to the magnifiers and tweezers. And he gave us a quick lesson on how to pan. Then, following his directions, we headed off for a new adventure. For the better part of our first day of field, we spent our time driving on various roads, some of which were not accommodating to a large 4x4 pickup and camper. Long trips of backing up and reversing direction found us sitting by a small stream in an exceptionally dark forest, where the sun sneaked away behind the mountains before we knew it. And even though we could look up to see light, we needed our battery camping lamps and our cozy campfire to comfortably see. We relaxed by the fire, had a few beers and roasted hot dogs and marshmallows like kids, looking forward to striking it rich on the morrow. Early the next morning, we were awakened by a loud rapping that we joked was a woodpecker alarm clock. After a hasty breakfast and a coffee to take the morning chill away, as it was colder than we had prepared for, we spent a couple of hours trying to even find a way to get enough material in a gold pan to even be able to find any sand, let alone be able to look for gold. It seemed that the entire stream was just golf ball to basketball sized rocks, and we finally gave up and got back out to the highway heading north until we saw a rather well-traveled dirt road heading east. By now, we likely were very close to the Oregon border, but it wasn't like anyone would care way up in these mountains. We came to a fork, and since we were looking for water, we took the road that headed downward. Down we went. The road curved first right, then left, and it branched off in different places but we stayed on the main traveled part, and it was a well-maintained route, even though we never saw another vehicle. Finally, we saw a stream, and it curved close to the road at one point, where we could see a clear spot where someone had likely camped alongside a monstrous pine tree on our left side. We pulled in, and first checked the stream. It was perfect for what we wanted. It curved abruptly away and directly opposite of where we were and toward some rugged-looking hills with a large mountain towering above this beautiful valley. We totally unpacked the truck at this point, camp stove, coolers, and all of our other gear. We put some beers in the cold stream and set up camp. It was absolutely the thing dreams are about. We even built a fire pit for aesthetics mainly, as we had a Coleman stove, and we even cut a couple of poles to erect a lean-to tarp. Then, after a little refreshment, we were ready to become gold miners. Four hours later, we began to realize that the romantic notions of gold mining really had to be more dream than reality. Even with rubber boots, our feet were almost frozen. It is not possible to squat and pan gold comfortably. Even with hip boots, you still have to kneel down and water is bound to get in. Besides that, muscling larger rocks by prying, 
shoving, lifting, and prying again is hard on the back and legs. The process of first moving aside those largest rocks, you can and shoveling and scraping up enough gravel to partially fill the gold pan, then picking out the large stones to get down to the fine sand is a long and extremely tedious route to get down to the real meat of it. If I sound negative, don't get me wrong. It was exciting, especially when we got down to the point of finding the treasure of black sand. Our instructors and advisors all told us that is the key to finding gold. It makes sense because the black sand is the heaviest and sinks to the very bottom, likely because there may be lead or whatever in it. All we know is that's the key. Gold is even heavier. And finally, I found black sand, and I thought I'd hit the mother load, as they say. I carefully picked out the pebbles, and there, across the bottom of my green pan, was a bottom covered in black sand. And scattered among the black sand were about 20 pieces of gold, as large as aspirin, but flat. I yelled to my partner, who was down scream, and he scrambled over to see my wealth. I guess he must have heard something I missed, because the first thing he did was to crush my gold pieces with his fingernail. It just shredded in the pan, and I was introduced to silica. No gold, just gold-colored flakes. That, when crushed, are light enough to float on water. I was crushed as well. I had enough for one day, so we just built a campfire by the water as it was cooling in the mountain valley, even though it was still two hours before sunset. The next morning, we were again awakened, when it was still dark in the valley, but by a rapping sound. I said, looks like our woodpecker followed us. However, this was different, louder, a lot louder like a heavy stick being pounded against a hollow tree. That was how both of us described it, but soon forgot about it. After breakfast, we were gold miners once more. By mid-afternoon, we finally found some real gold. Digging down on the downstream side of a huge boulder that covered half the creek, I was elbow deep and up close to my chin in water. But... I was bringing up some really black sand. My first attempt found my pan almost half full of sand. I moved closer to the shore so I could kneel closer to the pan, and I carefully sloshed the contents back and forth. And now the yell I let out was real. I had found gold, many pieces with several as large as the head of a common straight pin. My partner joined me, in working deeper and wider all around this large boulder, and by late afternoon, we had half of the gold collector bottle full of gold. Success at last. It was really a lot of work, but from what we had been warned about, we felt very lucky. That stuff is heavy. We knocked off early in the evening, tired from our exertions, and turned in right after dark. We were both exhausted. Sometime in the middle of the night, we woke to a crashing. Something had smashed against the camper. We both jerked awake, grabbed flashlights, and bolted out the door with revolvers in hand. My partner had a 38 caliber, and mine was a 22. Never thinking we'd need them for protection, but now we were under attack. Shining our lights all around the area, we saw nothing. Our camp stove was lying smashed alongside the camper where it had been thrown, and the side window was cracked and a chunk of fiberglass was hanging loose, so whatever threw it had a lot of power. We had two powerful searchlights, but did not see a thing anywhere. Neither of us could sleep after that, so we made a fire and sat there for two hours until dawn. Once it was light enough, we searched for signs of what or who could have destroyed our stove, and we found very large, 
bare human-like footprints all around the truck and down by the water where we had left our mining tool. The intruder had also taken a shovel and our pans, one which we found way down the creek on the opposite bank. It was split in half, and that is exceptionally hard to conceive of, as tough as they are. We took our guns and followed the gigantic footprints which led along the creek going downstream, and then around a bend marked by a large dead tree. They disappeared. We figured that either it crossed the creek or went into the thick bramble and blackberry bushes that surrounded the huge tree. It was then that we heard a loud crash back at the truck. We headed back on a dead run, slogging through the soft sand near the creek, as it was still a faster path than the razor-sharp thorns and blackberries. As we approached, running as we could in our Birkenstocks, California dress shoes, and nearing the truck, we saw a large rock fly from the patch of bushes and pine trees about 50 feet from the truck, and this rock was about the size of a basketball. It hit the passenger side, smashing the door and shattering the window. We both fired our revolvers at the place the rock had come from. I think we emptied both guns, as I remember, because we were both reloading before we moved further. The passenger side door was totally crushed. There was glass all over the inside, and the rock was on the passenger side floor. I hate to admit it, but anything that could throw a hundred pound rock over fifty feet is more than enough adventure. We got out of there as fast as we could, get the mess scraped out of the truck, and throw the rest of the gear into the camper. While watching warily for an attack, we hit the road, and then we made a point to find our contact back in Happy Camp, and when we told him what had happened, he calmly answered that he should have warned us, but it's a little early in the year for any Sasquatch sightings, so maybe it may have had young nearby that it was protecting. He went on to say from our description that the area we described was hardly ever visited by people, because the road ended about a quarter of a mile from where we camped. Looks like most people turned around and left. That's why it looked so used. I almost wish we had turned around also. The good news, if just having the encounter of a lifetime was not enough, we had the gold appraised at $480. We split it and are saving it as a conversation piece on our coffee tables with our wives' permission, of course. On to the next one. Sometimes called Dreamland, Area 51 is indeed a hazy dream world where fantasy seems to intersect with reality. The place is so fantastic, in fact, that for most of its history, the U.S. military denied its very existence. Although various individuals came forward, with testimony of military activity there, until 2013, the Pentagon claimed to know absolutely nothing about it. So, why all the secrecy? The most obvious answer is that top-secret military aircrafts were being tested at this base. The government didn't want any leaks about these projects, and they decided that leaks from a non-existent airbase would be even less credible than usual. In a Cold War context, such secrecy is certainly understandable. But conspiracy theorists believe there is more to this story than that. They believe that the base hides alien technology, as well as top-secret human tech, and also that the U.S. military is working hand-in-hand -hand with extraterrestrial beings at Area 51. But before we delve into these theories, let's take a look at the basic history of the base. Whatever else may be true about Area 51, a little bit of factual background will help set the scene. The land on which Area 51 is located 
was formerly barren desert, inhabited only by a few isolated encampments of Shoshone Native Americans who had lived in the region for centuries. In 1940, the U.S. military set up a small base called the Las Vegas Bombing and Gunnery Range. The area is around 80 miles north of Las Vegas. After World War II came to a close in 1945, the newly established Atomic Energy Commission requisitioned a sizable portion of the land to carry out atomic tests resulting in the creation of the Nevada Proving Grounds. Initially, the atomic bombs were detonated on the desert surface, but after the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963, atomic research literally went underground. The U.S. Air Force, meanwhile, grabbed up another corner of the tract, which had been divided into a grid of numerical quadrants for ease of reference. The portion the Air Force took happened to be labeled Area 51. Soon, several exotic new aircraft were being tested there under conditions of utmost secrecy. These included the U-2 spy plane, dating from the early 1950s, and the SR-71 Blackbird, which was created in the 1960s, can soar up to 100,000 feet and look like something straight out of a science fiction novel. Eventually, Area 51 produced the stealth fighters and bombers that would capture the world's attention in the 1980s and 1990s. Even more advanced crafts are said to be in the works now. But is all of this the result of military R&D, or is there something else behind it? According to conspiracy theorists, these aircrafts are much more the fruit of reverse engineering than human innovation and industry. And not only that, it is also alleged that actual ET engineers are on the ground assisting their human counterparts. One of the more fantastical, even for Dreamland reports, a man named Bill Uhouse claims to have worked with an alien called J-Rod on flight simulators intended to train U.S. Air Force pilots in the operation of UFOs. According to U-House, the UFOs fly via a direct neural link with the ET's mind. The entities literally become one with their craft, allowing them to fly by reflex and cutting response time to almost nothing. This is why UFOs are seen turning on a dime and making other incredible rapid maneuvers. But U-House and J-Rod had their work cut out for them. Finding a technological bridge that would allow humans to link up in the same way provided to be an extremely difficult proposition. This strange story was later corroborated by a microbiologist named Dan Bursich, who says he was sent to Area 51 in the 1990s and ordered to take tissue samples from live ETs such as J-Rod. Such as J-Rod. The aliens lived in a perfectly round sphere chamber that shielded them from human pathogens. Bursich also saw U-House's flight simulator, which consisted of a giant support arm that held prototype crafts in place and allowed simulated rotation. The crafts were powered by external energy capacitors. These large batteries could only power the craft for a short time, but... It was enough to allow human pilots to try their luck in brief simulated flight maneuvers. Such training sessions were also documented by the late Colonel Philip Corso, whose book, The Day After Roswell, written shortly before he passed away, claims that all manner of alien tech is being tested at Area 51. Corso confirmed that the craft were operated by a neural link directly to the ET's brain. The flight simulator could give humans an idea of how to fly the craft, but no major progress could be made until a means of actually linking up a human mind to the craft was created. Another man who features prominently in UFO lore, research scientist Bob Lazar, claims that he was one of the people assigned to that task. Lazar says 
He was hired on at Area 51 in late 1988 as part of a team of scientists investigating an exotic propulsion system. In a classic case of the military keeping things on a need-to-know basis, he was initially told very little about where the new technology originated. In fact, he was simply walked right up to a flying saucer and unceremoniously informed that this vehicle would be the object of his efforts. Lazar recalls being astonished by the strange craft, but he didn't think that it was extraterrestrial in nature. On the contrary, he thought he had just been given a down-to-earth explanation for all those UFO sightings. He assumed that since the U.S. military had something like this in their possession, it meant that all the flying saucers being reported in American skies were actually secret military crafts. But when he was allowed into the object, he quickly realized this simply wasn't the case. First of all, he noticed that all the seats, control deck, and all other aspects of the vehicle were too small for human use. But even more telling were the alarm bells of his intuition. Lazar couldn't quite explain it, but upon stepping into the vehicle, a chill ran down his spine, and he just somehow knew that this craft didn't belong to this world. Lazar's worldview may have been mercilessly shattered by this discovery, but he stayed on the project and began on trying to understand the gravity amplifiers which the craft used for propulsion. He also looked into the fuel that these amplifiers ran on, which he claimed was based upon element 115, an element that didn't even exist on the periodic table back in the 1980s. It wasn't until 2003 that scientists first synthesized an element with that atomic number, which is now known as Muscovium. So, what's really going on in Dreamland? Is it home to a military collaboration with E.T.? Or is it simply a high-tech research hub for conventional aircraft? We can only hope that someday the complete and unredacted truth of the matter will finally emerge. Until then, it's all just speculation. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!